Dr. Campbell began work at Bradley University in 1998 and is currently a professor in the Mon Logwalski Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. His research interests are in the areas of materials chemistry and chemistry education. In the fall of 2007, he and Bradley and the Bradley University Chemistry Club, which is the undergraduate student chapter of the National American Chemical Society, formed the Demo Crew. The purpose of this group is to educate people about science through live demonstrations. Since its formation, the Demo Crew has reached out to over 32,500 audience members of all ages in over 330 events in five Illinois counties. With most outreach events suspended due to the pandemic, he's placing demo videos on YouTube channel uh, Chem Demos in order to continue sharing information with the public. Today, Dean Campbell will talk about bringing space science into chemistry outreach events. Hello there, thank you. All right, I'm gonna be showing things through my, uh, through my document camera, so. Mm -hmm. Just gonna flip this around. Hi everybody, <laughs> uh, I'm in the chemistry lab, general chemistry lab here at Bradley. We just finished lab about an hour or so ago. And I have uh, all this, my little dog and pony show set up here that I want to show you. So I know we're a little strapped for time. So I want to get rolling on this. Okay. Um, I, the title of the talk is Moles to Mars, Bringing Space Science into Chemistry Outreach Events. And to get started here, I want to load up some demos and get that going. Okay. Because some of these take a little while. So what I have here is a solution of uh, hydrogen peroxide with a little bit of acid, a little bit of dish soap added. And I have some rusty BBs here, rusty spheres. And so I'm gonna pour these into here and let that sit for a little while. Okay. And before we started, I have a little, um, uh, uh, a little fuel cell car here that I've been uh, charging up with uh, discharge from a batteries. Okay. And I have some hot hands hand warmers here. Open these, this packet up. I have a bottle that I emptied and I'm gonna cut this open and try not to make too big of a mess, but I'm gonna pour this iron and uh, cellulose and other items from the contents of these hot hand hand warmers. Try not to make too big of a mess into this bottle. And then I'm going to seal it up. I'm gonna set these items aside. Okay. And I'm gonna be going in earnest here, okay. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction. That was a good uh, sketch about what the demo crew is about. We were formed in 2007 as part of the uh, undergraduate American Chemical Society chapter here at Bradley University. Um, we try to get students, undergraduate students, wherever possible to be involved in these events. We've had a couple hundred over the years. We try to reach out within about an hour radius of Peoria, Illinois. That's where Bradley is. And um, do on-campus and off-campus venues we reach out to what we call pre-K to gray, all ages. Um, we do make a big point to make these uh, demos scientifically connected and not magic tricks. That's just something I take extremely seriously, but we've reached out to a lot of people over the years. Okay, so you might say central Illinois, what are the central Illinois connections to space? Well, we have one of the world's largest scale models of the solar system centered at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. This is my daughter standing next to the model of Earth, which is five inches across. Um, we have a buried impact crater near Glassford, Illinois, the Glassford Disturbance. I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Clyde Tombaugh, uh, who discovered Pluto, was born in Streeter. And uh, we have a few astronauts who we can lay claim to. Uh, Captain Scott Altman was born in Lincoln, Illinois, and he went to Pekin Community High School. 
and he went to the U of I. I know a lot of you are at the U of I. And uh, he wound up being in four space shuttle missions and he has this elementary school in Pekin named in his honor. And I would be extremely remiss if I didn't re mention Bradley's contribution to space, Major Robert H. Lawrence Jr. He was born in Chicago, graduated in high school at age 16. He earned his BH in chemistry from Bradley University in 1956. Earned his PhD in physical chemistry from Ohio State University. He was selected to participate in the MOLE program, which was ultimately canceled, but see that sort of Gemini type rocket in the background here. Um, he uh, developed flight landing profiles for the space shuttle. Um, he was training another pilot when the student crash landed the plane, both pilots ejected, but he was killed. Okay, but in 1997, he found he was it had his name inscribed on the space mirror, and uh, he is considered uh, America's first black astronaut. And we're proud to have him as a Bradley graduate. Okay, and then we have buildings over in the area named after him. Uh, we have the Lawrence Lecture Hall, etc. And the story doesn't end there. Last February. The uh, uh, Northrop Grumman Cygnus robotic resupply spacecraft was launched to the International Space Station, and that capsule was named the SS Robert Lawrence after Robert Lawrence. And we had a little launch party on campus, okay? And uh, uh, that was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, the, <laughs> the mission was delayed, and so it had to launch about a week later, but we did have a lot of fun setting up that, that launch party. Okay, so more into the demos here. Let's talk about what it takes to get into space. Now, I kind of geared the demos for the, today's presentation to some of my favorite cadre of students about eighth grade, okay? Um, but it can be adapted for a variety of ages. We get to space by being light and energetic, okay? And think about lightweight, we need to think about gravity. And I can't claim credit for this one. I got these from the Challenger Learning Center in Normal, Illinois. This is a bottle, with a soda bottle with the Pepsi logo removed and uh, an Earth logo here. And it says 640 grams because this bottle has a mass of 640 grams. It will weigh, we have that weight of a soda bottle here at Earth. Now, if we wanted to show what it would like be like at other planets or in other worlds, we could empty out that soda and fill it with just maybe a little bit of sand. So this is what it would be like on the moon. And so it would, it would effectively weigh 102 grams, okay? If we went to Mars, it'd be 250 grams. If we went to Jupiter, well, I can't even use sand for that. I have to fill it with sand and nails in order to get it sufficiently. When I pass these around to the kids at demo events, I tell them not to drop this on each other's foot but you can see it's 1753 grams, okay? So we can make connections to gravity as a challenge that must be overcome. Now, we can talk about, we can talk about lightweight materials that, that can be overcome to go into space. Here, this is an exhibit I took a photograph of at the uh, St. Louis Science Center. You see a milk carton here and behind it is an imaginary, a pretend stack of money that you'd have to spend in order to launch that milk carton into space. I thought that was a pretty good graphic, but I have an old space shuttle tile, okay? And I pass this around wrapped up in plastic, but uh, it's very fragile and this weighs 80 grams, okay? Now, when I originally thought of ceramic heat shield tiles, I would think of something like this, bathroom tile. This weighs, this is smaller, but it weighs about 180 grams. You can see that this tile is a lot more dense than this heat shield tile, okay? And uh, it's fragile. It's been beat up quite a bit over the years. If I flip it over, I can see fingernail marks from where the kids have kind of squished it a bit, but we've had this for 20 some years. This is what an electron micrograph looks like of the fibers inside that tile. You can see that the glass fibers are sort of sintered together, right? Okay, other props that we show at outreach events, uh, urethane foam, then insulation for uh, various spacecraft. This is just great stuff, urethane foam. Um, I have a sample of dodecane here, which I use as a sample of, uh, to represent the kerosene that they use in rocket fuel. Now, real kerosene they use in rocket fuel is more branched. This is linear, but it's a good first approximation. 
okay? It gets dicey when you try and run around with rocket fuel. We have to be careful. But there's another in where to rocket fuel you can make if you have access to nitrogen dioxide. And we use these in general chemistry classes when we talk about equilibria. This is a tube that contains nitrogen dioxide and a little bit of dinitrogen tetroxide, okay? This is a tube that I just pulled out of an ice bath and it also has nitrogen dioxide, which is brown and colorless dinitrogen tetroxide. You can see that this tube is lighter in color because when it gets cool, it shifts the equilibrium to produce more dinitrogen tetroxide, which gets combined with hydrazine type compounds in hypergolic fuel systems. So if you look around, there's all sorts of fun props you can find, okay? We can also get to space by being tough and clean. And here we have some people uh, working on the, the latest Mars rover, the Perseverance rover, and you notice they're all dressed up in PPE. And so that brought an, a, a, to mind a connection we can make. So I'm gonna draw your attention to the fume hood behind me, okay? And I have a polypropylene cup. It's squishy at room temperature. But what I'm going to do is set off the hood alarms. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pour in some liquid nitrogen. And let that chill for a bit. And while that's going, I'm going to show you this. Okay, you see that bit of yellow paper up there? This is how we can model PPE, all right? I have a bottle of ammonia. This is goldenrod colored paper that changes color when it's struck by ammonia. But I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a face mask over this. And this is gonna represent, I'm gonna cough into the face mask, that is spray the ammonia bottle. <laughs> Okay, you can see that it's not really reaching the paper. But if I take the mask off, <coughs> you can see that I can get the paper to change colors. And so this not only works as a descriptor for PPE in clean rooms, but you can imagine it works as an excellent descriptor for PPE in the COVID crisis. Okay, so I'm gonna draw your attention back down to here to this polypropylene container. Now this polypropylene container, when it gets below about oh, zero Fahrenheit, maybe a little lower, it passes through a glass transition temperature and becomes brittle. We saw this when we were putting cups outside a couple of weeks ago. In fact, we have movies of that on that, on that YouTube site. But uh, I don't have a cold snap outside right now, so I'm gonna pour off this liquid nitrogen. And you can see that I definitely crossed below that glass transition temperature or that polypropylene. And space can be cold, space can be hot. We have to have materials that can withstand a uh, uh, variety of temperatures. I'm sure I could all point you to the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster uh, many years ago and, uh, and the problems they had with the um, O-rings and the problems they had when those got cold, okay? But we get to Mars or other places, and we might want to explore meteor impact craters like the Gale Crater or the Jezero Crater on Mars. We have craters here on Earth. Like I said, the Glassford Disturbance is uh, about a half hour southwest of Peoria. You can't see the crater, but if you drive to ground zero where that crater is, you find a gas pumping plant because they store natural gas underground in that shattered rock, apparently. If you were to drill down, you'd find maybe shatter cones and stuff like that. We have a demo that we use to, what, to describe uh, impact craters. This is a, a tub of flour with a little bit of black fabric on it with an impact location. I have a marble meteor and a guide tube here. If I drop this here, you can see that I have splashed flour out across this black uh, fabric and we've made a wonderful ray pattern. If you look at images of the moon and other planets, you can see ray patterns extending beyond there um, outside of the crater. 
Um, I have a couple tectites here uh, that I sometimes show, just looks like black bits of glass um, that I sometimes use when I talk about meteor impact debris, okay? But there are lots of different things we can sample on other planets. Uh, obviously, it's gonna be really hard for people to get access to it, you know, you and me, unless we have some very special grants, but we can fake it with rocks we know on Earth. For example, uh, basalt can be found on Mars and on the moon, other planets, okay, and easily found here on Earth. Uh, if we want a little reddish uh, lava rock, that can we, we can find pretty easily, okay. Um, re representing that iron oxide that is so prevalent on Mars. We can even get some sulfur and talk about things like um, uh, the sulfur deposits on the moon of, uh, moon of Jupiter Io, the pizza moon, right? Where they have lots of different colored sulfur deposits. Uh, another prop a student gave me, uh, one of my uh, students in one of my classes went off to do uh, research over a summer where they were making simulated Mars cement. And he gave me a sample of the simulated Mars cement made from simulated uh, Martian rocks and soil. Okay, so all sorts of fun things we can show. Uh, we can talk about studying elements within the rocks. Okay, uh, we have this rover here with the laser that could be used to excite the elements in the rocks and get them to glow and look at the different colors they produce. That's easily done with fireworks, but we could also use a propane torch. I have a propane torch right here. And if I take a bit of baking soda and sprinkle it into the propane torch flame, you can see it glows that bright yellow from the sodium that's in the flame. Okay, real simple demos that we can use to prove points. If we want to talk about gases on other worlds, we can show graphs, <laughs> we can show line graphs, or we can uh, make, uh, well, we sort of made it a physical thing. We, uh, we took uh, Lego bricks, and each of, these bri each of these brick stacks are 100 bricks long. Here's a big one here that I, uh, I have, but it's a little too big for the scale of this camera here. But each brick represent a percentage gas in the atmosphere where, for example, and this is a nice prop to hold up in an outreach event, okay? Uh, but yellow is rep represents carbon dioxide, white represents nitrogen, green represents oxygen, black represents argon. Okay, and we can hold this up and we can ask the kids, which one of these is not like the other? And we can say Earth is very much not like the other. It has very much less carbon dioxide. And on this scale, it would just simply be this tiny yellow brick representing 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. Of course, that brick is getting bigger and we're getting uptight about that. But um, we can say Earth is different from the others. Why? We can connect it to plants consuming carbon dioxide and producing oxygen and uh, making almost environmental connections along the way. And we can get into specific gases, okay? Carbon dioxide, for example, there's a lot of that on Mars. Um, one of the things we can show with carbon dioxide is we can get a hold of these little whack packs These are little Valentines that come, came out at Dollar Tree about a month or two ago. They could contain, it's a self-inflating balloon containing citric acid and baking soda. If I take the whack pack and hit it, okay, you can see that the pack will actually inflate as the baking soda and citric acid interact with each other to produce carbon dioxide, and it makes a little self-inflating balloon, okay? So we can use this when we make connections to carbon dioxide. We can also talk about airbag landers, uh, airbag cushioning systems on certain space probes. Now, the uh, space probes that use the airbags on Mars use solid rocket fuel, which obviously we're not going to use, <laughs> okay? But there are some connections we can make, all right? Um, we can talk about isotope loss from the Martian atmosphere. You may know that uh, the Mars's atmosphere uh, uh, seems to be a little bit uh, hydrogen poor here or I'm sorry, a little bit enriched in deuterium and a little bit depleted in protium, just a little bit. But what we can do is we have this, this container that we made from 
um, two petri dishes, one with a divider, and we have the heavy beads on one side. And uh, or I'm sorry, all the beads on one side represent Mars atmosphere. This side represents space. If I gently shake this, what we find is that the orange lighter weight beads tend to move over to the other side more than the heavier white beads. And we can say, okay, this is a connection we can make to the loss of lighter isotopes into space from Mars, okay? We can also use this to talk about isotope distributions in, or in our own ice caps. All right, so um, another gas we can talk about you know, with, that we have great interest in is oxygen gas. A lot of oxygen that you could produce on Mars would get incorporated into other compounds. Let's go back to that bottle that has that heat pack uh, um, material. It has iron and it also has uh, carbon and a little bit of cellulose, but it's the iron we're mostly interested in. This bottle has contracted because the iron has picked up the oxygen from the air within the bottle, okay? And so we can show oxygen being fixed that way, if you will. We can also show oxygen being produced from other oxygen containing compounds. Let's go back to these uh, um, iron beads that I had, these rusty beads in a hydrogen peroxide, acidic hydrogen peroxide solution with dish soap in it. And you can see, perhaps you can see that it's fizzing a little bit here. And the, the soap captures the bubbles to make a foam which if I left this long enough, it would have probably eventually rise up out of the top of the container, okay? So again, this shows getting oxygen from other compounds. Now, some oxygen containing compounds uh, are release their oxygen pretty readily. Some need a bit more persuasion, okay? And so this brings us to electrolysis, all right? So going back to this little fuel cell car here, I have, um, right now it's set up like an electrolytic cell. I have an external power source splitting water at these electrodes and they're building up in this reservoir. If I take the oxygen from this split water and the hydrogen produced from the split water, I can recombine them across these electrodes across this fuel cell. There we go. And I can turn the little wheel on the car. See, I can make a ooh, I can, I can drive to work if I were the size of a Barbie doll, okay? Now, there's a trick here in the sense that um, there's not a whole lot of liquid water on Mars, okay? So people are looking at other oxygen-containing sources. Um, you may be familiar with the MOXIE experiment that's on the Perseverance lander, where they're going to take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and convert it to oxygen gas and carbon monoxide uh, doing electrolysis effectively. I'm very excited to see how that all turns out. Okay, so um, one other thing you can do with hydrogen is you can burn it And so I have a little balloon filled with hydrogen. We like to end our demo, we used to like to end our demo shows with this a lot. There became sort of an issue about making sure that kids covered their ears and stuff like that. And so we haven't used this a whole lot. And since I'm the only one in this lab, I thought, hey, I'll wrap up with a hydrogen balloon. And so if we burn hydrogen, it gets kind of fun. Okay, so. On behalf of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Bradley University, thank you for watching this little presentation. We enjoy funding from the Illinois Space Grant Consortium. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you again. Also from the Illinois Heartland section of the American Chemical Society and other uh, donations and organizations. So again, thank you for watching this little presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell. If anyone has any questions, you should be able to unmute yourself now. 
Dr. Campbell, this is Heidi from the Illinois Space Grant Consortium. Um, I did want to ask, do you, you said you have most of the videos out here um, on the, the YouTube page. Are, are you going to be adding any more this, this spring? Yeah, we've got about 40 or 50. Um, they aren't all space related. In fact, a good number of these are not yet on there. But uh, for example, I shot a video, I went to that, uh, the Glassford disturbance, and I shot a little video there. It was November. <laughs> it was really cold, but but I, I shot a video of dropping the the marble into the flower at, at location, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, I've got one was showing the fuel cell car, and and uh, I think I pop a balloon in that one too. So uh, I'm still working on putting them up. It, it depends on when I have time and and uh, what what matches. So I intend to grow that site. But we've got a lot of other chemistry related things as well. When we do a show, it's usually not purely space focused. It's, it's part of it, but there's so many other things. I'm, I'm trying to bring in a lot of, of green chemistry and environmental science. And to me, that meshes well with space anyway. So there's, there's a, so many things we can talk about. Yes, thank you. I, I think these were really interesting to, to bring in how you bring everything down to a level to understand. I, I have a comment. I'm going to have my graduate student watching all your videos. Those are brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I actually recorded a draft version of this talk uh, this morning because even though we have not been able to do outreach at the schools, you know, because of COVID, um, there, were, there are some schools that I've been doing demos at for many years, and we're, we're trying to do some online presentation. So we'll see how that goes. So I'm really much, very much looking forward to going back to face-to-face -face events though. I bet, I think it's probably a lot more fun to show these where you can uh, have the reactions of the crowd. And if you have any questions about how these are done or suggestions, ideas, I'd love to hear from you.